Welcome to Colony TV, the governmental educational channel for the town of Colony. Welcome to Parenting in the 21st Century. I'm Zena Shevchik. Today we have with us Kara Beauchamp, physician assistant in family practice with the family, excuse me, with the Latham Medical Group of Community Care Physicians. We're going to talk today about maintaining our teens' good health. Thank you very much for being with us today, Kara. You're welcome. Why don't you tell us something about you, yourself, about your background and the job you do at Latham Medical Group? Okay. Um, I have been at Latham Medical Group for approximately three and a half years. Um, I, got, I did my training at Springfield College where I got my degree um, as a PA and um, working for community care in Latham Medical Group now for about three and a half years. What does a physician assistant do? A physician assistant is sort of like a physician extender. We work with physicians um, to provide very similar care um, to patients. We do routine exams, we do sick visits, we do follow-up visits, working sort of you know side by side with with the doctors in the group. You have Latham Medical Group is a pretty big group. We have 12 providers in all, 10 physicians and two physician assistants. And by family practice, tell me what that encompasses. It's from birth, from birth to? Yep, from, from birth all the way through. We see patients of all ages. Are there specialists, um, doctors, specialists within the group? Are there, there are pediatricians? Well, there are specialists within community care. Okay. Um, our office particularly as family medicine. Okay. Um, we do have a few physicians who have sort of their own kind of specialty, whether it be OBGYN or sports medicine or you know, just, but it's typically just family practice. Okay. So today you're here to uh, educate us about uh, maintaining our uh, children's health during their teen years. And so my first question, my broadest question is, what should parents know? Uh, what should they do to keep their teenagers healthy? We have actually been talking about this a lot lately um, as far as trying to get um, patients in for well visits. Um, a lot of teenagers and their parents feel, oh, well, my kid's healthy. Why do I need to go in and bring them into the doctor? Um, but we have a lot of things that we can, we can work with them and a lot of things we should be doing with our teenage population every single year in an uh, annual exam, just like when they were small children and came in every year for a physical to monitor growth um, and behaviors and immunizations. That should extend you know, right through life. You should always have a physical every year. Okay. And <laughs> you should. And a lot of times um, kids don't come in unless they have a sports physical paper they have to have filled out or their school mandates that when they enter that grade they have to go get a, a physical exam. And a lot of times it's two, three years prior to that that we've even seen that child in the office. And teenagers are going through their bodies, their minds, their brains, everything. they're going through tremendous changes. So it seems like it should be a priority for teenagers to be seen as they're going through all these changes. Yes, yes. We, um, we do a lot of preventative medicine with teenagers, just like we do preventative medicine with adults and children. Um, there are some immunizations that are important to get in the teenage years that, you know, sometimes are missed or they don't get them until they're ready to go to college because they're coming in for a college physical when they should have had the, the, the uh, immunizations previously. Um, a lot of schools are now requiring a tetanus booster at age 11, 
which is the mm -hmm. same tetanus booster you get when you're an infant. So the it's M it's the yeah, it's the no, nope, it's a Tdap. It's the um, tetanus diphtheria okay. pertussis booster. Right. Um, there was quite a resurgence of whooping cough in this area a few years back, and now it's recommended that this booster be given instead of a regular tetanus booster. And I do know that some of the school districts are actually requiring that at 11 years old or else they can't come to school. Okay. Um, along with repeat um, chicken box boosters. We found that you know one chickenpox shot for a lifetime is probably not enough, and we recommend a booster. And little kids get that, you know, when they're one, and then again when they're four. But for that population of teenagers who are now older than before that recommendation came out, have only gotten the one shot, and it is recommended that they, they get the second booster as well. And what age do you usually give that? Eleven, twelve? I mean, well, that would are... no. That would be whenever that we catch it, because yeah. now we're giving it to them when they're younger, when they're when oh, they're littler. So, um, if a, if a fifteen year old comes in and they haven't had a second chickenpox shot, they're going to get one, um, or at least they should get one. Right, right. right. <laughs> um, the other the other important. Um, vaccine at this age is the meningococcal vaccine. It used to be that that was recommended at college time, and now we are recommending that earlier as well, around the 11 to 12 year mark. Oh, really? Mark. Mm -hmm. And that's meningitis, right? Yes. Is that what you're yeah. A lot of kids go away to camps and, you know, do different activities where they could still be exposed, just like a college student in a dorm setting, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so. we're much more mobile. I mean, the kids are much more mobile, just like their parents are now these days, right? They just go everywhere, do everything uh, around the world and uh, <laughs> uh, in the mountains and everything else. So, okay, that's yep. good. So, so that's another one we're, we're boostering earlier now. Um, and then the Gardasil vaccine is another one, teenage girls, and they're... I, they're coming out with the uh, recommendation that boys get it too. Oh, really? Um, not this, yet, but it's, it's coming. coming. Yeah. yeah. It, is it the same shot? Yeah. It's the same exact vaccine. Mm -hmm. All right. So, does does your practice recommend that for every girl? And, um, um, we do recommend. We do recommend it. Um, it's a little controversial as far as when they should get it. They should get it before they're sexually active, um, and that is to prevent exposure before the shot. I mean, if, you, if you're sexually active and you're exposed to HPV before you get the shot and then, it, then you get the shot, it didn't really do anything for you. So it is, the shot only protects you against four types of HPV, but those are the types that are more likely to cause cervical cancer. Um, there's still a chance to get HPV and... Could you say what that stands for? Maybe you already did human that. Human papillomavirus. Okay. All right. So um, that's something that, you know, we're just continuing to do education with. Some people aren't comfortable and aren't ready to, to do that one yet. So Right. That's and, it. It is, and it is an optional vaccine. Yeah. My teenage daughters, I, they were old enough to make their own decision. One decided to get it and the other decided not and she did a lot of research too and it was when it's new it was new I mean mm -hmm. it's, it's only been out a year and a half oh no two years oh no it's <laughs> I, I would have to say five six years at really least. yeah when did it get into the news was it that long ago that it was in the news really it's hard to say wow. I know I know it came out well before I started at Latham Medical Group okay so <laughs> I, so time has been flying for me I guess so so all right so you've given us a couple of uh, good reasons why teens should be uh, coming to see the doctor uh, every year um, uh, Talk about a little bit about obesity, diet, things like that. And, and that's something else we look at. We look at, you know, what shots are they due for. We look at what their weight is. There's, a, you know, a, a large, a large population of overweight teens, overweight children, um, and we do work with them on that. And a lot of times, I get, I told you so's from the parents because this also gives the parent another sort of voice telling their kid how they should be trying to manage their diet and their exercise. I get that a lot, especially in the teenage girl population. You know, you know, their their mother I'll tell I'll say, Hey, you know, 
you've gained 15 pounds since your physical a year and a half ago. You know, that's too much weight to gain in a year and a half. And the, usually the mom picks right up in there and says, I told you, you need to get more exercise. But they don't necessarily always just listen to what their parents say. So it, you know, you're, for them. For you, someone close, closer to their age in probably a lot of cases. And so, you know, it, it, it helps. comes across better. It helps to have someone else telling your child, you know, this is what you need to do to be ha healthy, because they, you know, they're like, oh, whatever, you know. Well, you can you can also um, authoritatively tell them about diabetes or cholesterol or you know things like that. Usually, what I do is I let them know what their body mass index is, and that's something that's a big, um, a big thing now, even with the with the school forms, um, even. Adult, even um, elementary school forms, but right up through high school school forms, um, the school wants to know what's this child's BMI. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, and we actually have a very nice electronic medical record that calculates this for us. So um, our charting system has uh, more like a graph, just like you would graph height and weight in a growing child. Um, and you can put in, you put in their height. BMI in a child under 18 is calculated by height, weight, and age. So you, you, with that information, the computer automatically calculates what their BMI is, and you can tell them what their BMI should be. And um, is it, does it, it, is it, I would imagine with teenagers maybe it varies a little bit because they, their growth mm -hmm. spurts and it that varies, kind of thing? It varies by sex, it varies by age. And there's different, you know, different calculations for that. So maybe one bad reading or you know higher reading might not, por might not portend uh, bad things right. to come. It doesn't. It doesn't necessarily mean you know they are obese or it doesn't necessarily mean it's as bad as it sounds because kids are built differently, um, especially boys. If they have a higher muscle mass. It's going to make their weight higher, and it's going to make their BMI higher. Okay. And so there is, it's not an absolute measure of body fat, but it is a good tool to use to sort of estimate body fat. And to chart progress or right. whatever, right. Or, uh, gaining weight, losing weight. Okay. So um, we use that, and actually Community Care has um, recently opened a, a program for overweight and obese adolescents and teenagers. Um, and this program, basically, you sign up, it's an eight-week program, and there is, you get a health coach, you get um, a nutritionist, and a personal trainer that works with you. And you meet individually for a session and develop your plan, and then you meet with a group of other adolescents and teenagers twice a week um, and, and exercise, talk about diet and, in, a, in a group setting. That's fantastic. So, so yeah. So that's something that you would refer? Right. Um, I would refer a patient to. to if they have a really hard time with what they should be eating, what they, what they, what they should or shouldn't be eating. When I, it doesn't seem like too long ago, but obviously I don't have a good time frame here. But it wasn't too long ago, it seems that people were talking about eating disorders um, anorexia and bulimia, um, particularly in teenage girls, is that le do you see less of that or now? Do you think uh, it's it's hard to say? I would it's it's still there, you know, it's still there. There's still plenty of of people, teenagers that have sort of you know anorexia, bulimia, or just sort of a overall misunderstanding about you know, what their body should look like and being comfortable in their body. Um, but that's something you that's, would pick up in an annual visit as well. It can, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's the parents that are the ones who come with those, fla you know, have the flags and not the, the child. And sometimes you don't always know by the child's weight that, you know, there's a concern and, you know, the parent will have the concern. and for good reason. Yes, right. So, yeah. so um, most, a lot of the time you're saying you, you see kids in their teen years because of sports 
Injuries or sports? Uh, well, for sports, form? they need a physical. They need a physical. Yeah. Okay. So they, they get in a little bit more often if they are if they have a physical that they need. And the girls are in doing sports now. I mean, co even compared to when my college-age kids were in school, there's even more, I believe, more participation by yeah. girls, which is good, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So, well, we catch a lot of things with the, when the girls come in for their physicals and you know, a lot of a lot of young girls when they come in, they, they don't know that, you know, they should have a pap smear or if they should have a pap smear and they don't know anything about it. So Are there guidelines for that? I mean, uh, uh, does a, does a uh, teenage girl need to be, or is it recommended that she not have a pap smear before she's active sexually, or is that a... The, the guidelines are always changing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and who issues these guidelines? Let's go, let's go, let's go to so that. So it's more that um, the guy, we have had some recent changes in this, and it's mostly because we're doing more and more pap smears. So we can take a look at, okay, you know, these are, the, these are all the, the results that we get. Who truly needs these exams? Um, and the very newest guidelines out are basically if uh, a girl is not sexually active, she does not need a pap until she's 23. Um, if she's sexually active before age 21, then she needs to be sexually active for three years before she actually needs a pap smear. And that's new. It used to be as soon as you became sexually active, you need a pap smear. Um, a lot of people have not adapted to the new you recommendation. Doctors? Yes. Okay. And our office included is because this is so very new, we're sort of now we have, you know, a seventeen year old who has been sexually active for two years, and they've already had two paps. Do you stop? Do you keep going? So it's 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 very personal at this point. Some patients I will recommend if they have recently become sexually active just to get STD testing, just to talk about contraception, and hold off on the pap. Right. So I, I, well, in the medical field certainly is changing. I mean, they, they just went through that kind of a thing um, with uh, uh, mammograms and breast exams, and I, I hear they're going starting about that with uh, prostate exams, whether or not the test is really a good measurement. And so uh, it, that's good that uh, that uh, it's being examined. And why you know go through ex excessive testing if it's not exactly. needed, and certainly for yes. a teenager. Exactly. Um, uh, Talk a little bit about the um, privacy issues, legal issues with uh, teenagers and their health care providers and their parents, that kind of thing. It gets tricky. <laughs> That's why I'm asking the expert. <laughs> so basically the way, the way it works is teenagers have a right to privacy when it comes to sexual health. Um, sensitive information we don't have to disclose to parents um, and that's of age 14 um, however if they have an STD test or we talk about birth control and you, it's billed in that manner because you can't really do much about that you have to bill for what you do um, it will show up on a statement that parents get so it's very, you know, as far as if someone wants, a, you know, an STD test or they're sexually active and they need an STD test and we do that, I can tell someone that, yes, I can't answer any questions that your parent might have because it's confidential, but this is going to show up on an explanation of benefits somewhere when, when, when they get that information. And the best thing to do really is be open and honest and try to get the teen to be open and honest with their parents. If that's not possible, sometimes I do recommend they go to Planned Parenthood where it's more anonymous and, and that information has no way of being disclosed. So in, in other words, unless they pay for it themselves, in yes. effect, unless they're paying for the consultation and the tests right. um, themselves, a uh, 14-year-old um, really uh, won't get much privacy. 
So that's because of the billing situation. Because of the billing situation. We actually have um, a new um, computer you know, um, system through community care, which is a patient portal which is actually pretty neat when it comes to the adolescent population because they can sign up as their own patient. So, and that is through email. So if they have a concern or they have a question, they don't feel comfortable coming in with their parent, as long as they are a current patient at Latham Medical Group, they can sign up with their provider and ask a question via email. Okay. Um, and at least this way, we can get some kind of you know ball rolling as some far education. as you know taking care of that. Right. Right. And a right. lot of times, when a, when a patient gets to be about fourteen or fifteen, we'll I'll do part of the exam with the parent present, and then I'll usually ask the parent to leave, um, just to do a little bit more education. And sometimes they feel more comfortable and more relaxed. Right. When, when their parent's not there, when we ask questions about, you know, intercourse and smoking and and, and things like that. Smoking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I imagine, well, that's another way to establish a rapport with an adult uh, health care worker to establish a rapport with a teenager on their own. Yeah. That's good. That's great. Um, is there anything else that you um, hone in on? Um, with a teenager that uh, maybe is a little bit different uh, when you're doing an annual exam that uh, might be different than what you might look at for, uh, you know, an elementary school teach uh, elementary mm -hmm. uh, student or an adult? Well, we talk about a lot of stuff. You know, I, I talk, you know, I talk about school. I always ask them, you know, how they're doing in school. I, you know, try to identify if they're having any problems with their peers, with their parents. Um, if they're having any depression issues or sleep problems, uh, adolescent and teenage depression is definitely out there and on the rise. Um, a lot of stress. Yeah. A lot mm -hmm. of stress. So, you know, we do, we do talk about those things talk as about, well. I assume you give them ideas for um, relieving stress or getting in a better mood. I, I mean, just by the fact that... Uh, their hormones are changing. You know, everything's changing. A lot of the mood swings, I would assume, are new to a lot of the teenagers, or early teenagers anyway. And yeah. so, uh, I, I would think that a teenager, I remember my teenagers, and I certainly didn't go to see a doctor, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, just the big question of, is this normal? Right. Am I normal? Is what I'm experiencing what everybody else is experiencing or within the range. Right, and again, a lot of times, you know, it's nice to have an outside person like us, like your doctor, telling you these things instead of your parent. Because, you know, parents get frustrated, you know, because teenagers don't, you know, teen some teenagers know everything, right? <laughs> so. And the teenagers will tell you the parents know everything, so don't they? So when they come in, when they come in, it's also a nice relief for the parents to to have some reinforcement on these things as far as school and behavior and, you know, so even the younger adolescents as far as, you know, acne and bathing and some of these, you know, kids you have a hard time with some of that kind of stuff. So it's it's definitely, you know, it's for the parent too because a lot of, uh, there's a lot of education involved and, you know, following a kid as they grow and mature and as other issues come up. Well, I even know with my uh, teenage daughters, I, you know, even something as simple as acne, I had no idea whether what they had was something that needed um, more care than what an over-the-counter uh, product could handle or not. So, I mean, that as simple as that, the doctor, you know, was able to immediately say, yes, you should, you know, you should be taking an antibiotic for just a short time, but, mm -hmm. but she had struggled, my daughter had struggled with it for a year or more, and uh, she probably needlessly had to do that. So, I mean, there's another simple thing, and it matters to teenagers, <laughs> oh, yeah. the, you know, their appearance. So yeah. that, that's, that's good. Um, when, here, let's talk a little bit about sleep. 
um, that was one of my, uh, with my teenagers, they, they said I was not uh, crazy, you know, because <laughs> I kept, in, I always would insist that they, they got seven or eight hours of sleep, and, you know, they, I, they obviously didn't go to sleep when I told them to, but they were in their room, but um, I, I hear that that's one of the most important things for, um, the, one of the easiest things to do to um, keep your immunity um, up, to help your immunity. And teenagers supposedly I, I have different bio rhythms. I mean, they have different sleep patterns. Am I right? They fall into different sleep patterns. And yeah, a lot of, a lot of teens have a hard time going to bed at night. It's very common. Um, things you can do is, you know, cut off caffeine at noontime, you know, no soda or energy drinks or any of that kind of stuff, you know, past the middle of the day, because it can affect you. Even if you have a soda at three o'clock in the afternoon, it can affect you trying to go to bed at night. So the caffeine stays in your, the caffeine and sugar, I suppose, yeah. stays in your system. You know, eating before bed, not a good idea, you know, that kind of things. Watching TV at night, not good for sleep. Listening to the radio, I mean, most of these, Things are more distracting, even though a teenager might tell you, oh, well, I need the radio to go to sleep at night. Well, the radio is while you're awake still two hours after you're laying in bed, you know. Um, so it's sleep hygiene is important. And I, I, I recently I read, I think I read something in the magazine about the, how the computer screen, the lights from the computer screen or the from the phones can disrupt your uh, sleep sleep patterns as well. I don't know about I'm that. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's I, I certainly know my, my you know my uh, college kids. Uh, they they're on their phones and texting all the time. It's hard hard to believe they're not like uh, alert all the time when they're texting. You know at midnight or something. So. Yeah, and I would also say that adolescents and teenagers need more like eight or nine hours of sleep than, than seven. Well, that's something for parents to know yeah. because you don't you don't know what what is the right amount. So if they can get an eight or nine, that's the best, yes. right? And I know I, in my school district, school started at seven thirty, and to me, that's uh, that's inhuman. <laughs> <laughs> but to expect someone to be alert at 7.30, maybe for someone in the healthcare field. I'm working at 7.30. <laughs> I know, I'm going to say someone in healthcare. But um, to me, that's, that's inhuman to, for, to expect them to do math, math at 7.30 in the morning. But that's why going to sleep early is important. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so that, I mean, that's something for pa that parents have questions about. Um, uh, what about nutrition? I mean, is there anything in particular that parents should be um, trying to help with their teens nutrition the food pyramids there for a reason you know <laughs> kids learn about this stuff in health class for a reason and it's actually true you know getting enough fruits and vegetables in a day I don't think adolescents and teenagers get anywhere near the fruits and vegetables that they should be getting in a day um, you mean french fries aren't a vegetable no <laughs> <laughs> And, and, you know, making sure that they're getting proteins, too, and, and just not eating a lot of junk and a lot of pizza and, you know, drinking milk. Uh, oh. a, lot of, a lot of kids stop drinking milk uh, at a fairly young age. And there's vitamin D, vitamin C. Vitamin D and calcium. Right. Yeah. Yep. Talk, talking about that as being so important now. It is very, about. yeah, it's very important. Because we never used to hear about vitamin D, always about vitamin C and calcium, but not about uh, D. And there's not many other places to get vitamin D besides the sun and fortified milk. So um, there are some fortified juices, like orange juice with calcium and D in it. But for the most part, you know, it's your milk and your and your sunlight that give you vitamin D. Is there anything that you would uh, like to talk about or uh, add to our conversation or reiterate that we've talked about today? We've covered quite a bit. Well, as far as the nutrition piece, um, I tell a lot of parents that if it's in the house, they're going to eat it. And the best thing to do is give them good food choices to pick from in the house. And if you're buying chips and you're buying cookies and you're buying soda and and they're going to grab it because it tastes better. Right. So the best thing to do is really to limit what's available to them when they come home from school and you know and and to really help tailor, you know, their their 
their nutrition habits. And the best thing to do is, you know, also as a parent, help your child get exercise. Get at, you know, not in front of the TV, not in front of the computer and the video games, but, you know, get outside, play a sport, exercise, you know, routinely to get some, some good lifestyle habits that hopefully they'll keep forever. Right, because it does matter what your early health matters in and terms of what yeah. you're going to face later. And it's not just, you know, I tell that to everybody who comes in, not just the teenagers, you know, and, and to get someone to start exercising, you know, which they probably should have been exercising a long time ago. But, you know, it's, it's good to start those habits early, and hopefully they'll carry them with them. Right. Would you tell us uh, how someone could get in touch with uh, you or the Latham Medical Group at Community Care? You know, phone number or email or <laughs> web page or address? <laughs> well, our main number is uh, 785-5881. And um, we are also online. Community Care has their own website. Um, I'm sure you could just uh, yeah, we'll, just put it up it. On the, we'll put it up. We'll put it up on the screen. <laughs> but um, and and it tells you a lot about community care in general. What's out there for you know practices and where we're located and what other services are involved with community care. Um, and you know we're all on. You know Latham Medical Group has their own link on the website, and you can go on there and look. You know which doctors are affiliated with our office and and read about them. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for being with us today, Kara. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for being with us, Parenting in the 21st Century.